What up, BlizzCon again? I'm so glad the opening's done. I did. <laughs> what did you guys think about the announcement? Seriously, we're, we're putting together, that art's not up there, we're putting together one of the most kick-ass expansion sets in a very long time. It's just, uh, it's mighty. Um, so the, the guys asked me to come with today. They're going to talk a lot about the systems of the game, what it's going to be. Um, uh, and they asked me to set it up a little bit. Um, so I'm going to try and do this uh, succinctly because uh, it's, as you might imagine, a little involved. Is that artwork ever going to be up on the screen? It's on our screen. They can't see that. We have the most kick-ass piece of artwork right here. So if that doesn't give you a little bit of an indication, <sighs> Alex Horley did that for us. He's a bad, bad man. They just look like a 70s classic rock group from hell. <laughs> Deep purple. What were we talking about? Warlords. 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 How do all you people get into my room? So why are we here, Chris? Uh, why are we, why are, we are here? Expansion? I want to serenade you from down here. Tommy. So let's talk a little bit about how, how did this happen. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it. It's very involved. I'm sure you guys are going to have a lot of questions. Um, we will get to them um, as we go through the weekend. We're going to do a lore panel uh, at 2.30 this afternoon in Hall A. The predicating fiction of this expansion set is that after the events of the Siege of Orgrimmar, Garrosh was taken away in chains. We may or may not be doing uh, a piece of fiction to talk about what happened immediately next. Suffice to say, Garrosh will be put on trial, and before the verdict can come down, he escapes. That bastard. That's what I was hoping you were going to vocalize. We've got you right where we want you. Pissed. <sighs> Garrosh has a new friend uh, who has, uh, uh, let's say, a unique ability uh, to bend time. Garrosh goes back, crestfallen, upset. The world didn't work out quite the way he thought it might. And he hates the Horde now, with his coalition of mongrel races and trolls and, 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 and elves, really. He hates this Horde and everything that Thrall ever stood for. And boy, does he hate the Alliance, too. So he's gone back to the place and the time where the world made sense to him. Of course, going back, of alters a little bit, but overarchingly, Garrosh's intent is to redeem the orcish ideal as he sees it. This is a kid who grew up in Garadar, who grew up with the stories of his, his old man and all these other champions, right, that came up at that time and formed the first horde, and he likes those stories. And he wants the orcs to be proud again, he wants them to be conquerors and not encumbered by all these other races that he just doesn't understand why they're part of the Horde. And so that is where he has gone. And the most critical element of his mission is to stop the one moment, literally, that defined the history of Azeroth. He's going to stop the moment where the orcs drink the blood of Manoroth. They will be uncursed they will not be under the sway of the Burning Legion. But again, he will convince them that they must be a horde, that there's conquering to be done, and he will build this iron horde. With all the chieftains of old, he will empower them with, don't panic, some of the technology and engineering that he loves from our present, black iron machines, flamethrowers, I, I don't even know yet. The guys, the guys know. 
Garage is going to build a very different kind of horde, but its mission is the same. Using his little friend that we talked about earlier that can manipulate time, oh, Garrosh is going to have them build a dark portal, and he is going to lead this iron horde through it. But his little friend has been given the task, kind of, of aligning it to our time. So the adventure of warlords, for the most part, takes place in what we call Old Draenor, a fully realized world, right? Steeped in all the lore that's come before. We built it to heighten and maximize your sense of what Outland was, but this is a contiguous continent. It's got oceans, it's got beautiful skies, it's got giants, it's got monsters. What kind of world forges a race like the orcs in the first place? It is a brutal place. And from the bones of this world, he would construct this army to enact his revenge on us. Having said all that, I'm sure many of you are thinking like, oh, God, don't tell us. Another orc, really? Tell us this orc is not the boss of the expansion series. We want to get ahead of it. He's not. Garrosh facilitates the storytelling. This was the natural flow. Uh, and while he will be heavily involved in the storytelling, he's not the guy. There's a guy behind the guy. Um, those of you who are astute may conclude very quickly who the guy might be, um, but we're gonna let that ride for a little while longer. I guess I'd also like to tease as the panel goes. The end boss of this whole giddy up as so far as we're thinking today, it won't just be an orc duty. Take that as you will. So, do you guys think of anything I haven't said that we should say? Or have I said too much? I think we're good. We can take it. Thinking. I'm not going to do it. Come on. Meaning, meaning. We are in a space where we're trying to think uh, very far ahead of the expansion sets we are currently working on. Although we can't get into it today for obvious reasons. How this one escalates uh, and what happens at the end of this one, it's gonna spill over into the next one. So as you guys call out names of characters you wanna see, yeah, we wanna see them too. So as usual, bear with us. I hope you guys are in for the long haul, because we are, and we've got expansion sets galore kind of lined up in the queue like bullets in a six-shooter. So please be patient with us. We will get to it all. Thank you, Chris. All right, so what's up? You know, Chris has been talking about this expansion takes place on Gretel. and. What is Dragon, right? This is, a, this is a brand new continent. This is a new world. This is not the Outland that you guys know. Um, Outland is that shattered remnant of the planet that once was Draenor. And so what we're getting to see here is what Draenor was back before all that stuff went down. Um, this was the home world of the orcs. This was the heart of the Draenei civilization. And this is a brutal primal world of giants. Um, it's got seven new zones, you know, of course, all the bells and whistles you guys would expect. And we'll be talking about all those zones in more detail later on in the panel. What are you here to do? Well, you're here to defeat the Iron Horde. These guys have found a way, as a result of Cairo Stormu and his involvement, to connect this world of Grand Ar of 35 years in the past, have that portal that gets built up connect to our time and we have an imminent invasion. So Gramash has united the Orc clans. He's brought them all back together, or at least most of them. You'll have a say in some of that. Uh, there are some clans that may not join. They plan to take their army through the Dark Portal and destroy Azeroth. This can't happen. You've got to stop it. So next up, we have a map. So this is what the uh, continent of Draenor looks like might be somewhat familiar. Um, obviously, there's that familiar kind of Euro shape on the eastern part of it. Uh, the place that we once knew as Hellfire Peninsula was at the time called Tanan Jungle. We 
have Shadow Moon Valley, which, uh, as we'll get to in a little bit, is an actual idyllic valley. It's not a, uh, a hellish, uh, you know, infernal draining from the sky kind of place. Uh, we've got Gorgrond. Um, if you imagine that Gorgrond was kind of where Blades Edge plus Foxfire, when those came, when the Earth, when the world shattered, those came together and collided that formed the Blades Edge Mountain. So there's a kind of clash of, of desert and and, uh, and also the, the frost. We've got Nagran, as you might expect. Uh, that was probably the least affected of the of the different zones back in Outland. Uh, it was still a bit different back in the day, and we'll, you know you'll learn more about that as time goes on. And then we've got Talador, which is the location of Shatrap, uh, which is not where your main city's going to be. Um, it's also the location of Akandun, but this is before Akandun blew up and went to hell. So as players, you're actually going to experience this content in a very different way. Um, as the Alliance, you're going to end up defending Karabor and saving it from the Iron Horde, and that's going to be your main city. Karabor is what you may have known as Black Temple in Outland. So that's actually going to be your city as the Alliance for the expansion. None of that Shatrap nonsense. For the Horde, for the Horde, you are going to, uh, you're gonna travel to Frostfire Ridge. And in Frostfire Ridge, you're going to uh, help the, the Frost Wolves fight against the ogres that are there. And you're gonna liberate the Ogre Citadel. There's a, there's a Blades, uh, Citadel there called the Bladespire Citadel. And that's going to be your city as well. So a lot of these places that, that will be familiar to you are actually completely different. And it's important to understand that this is very different than what we did uh, Cataclysm, right? When we when we did Cataclysm, we took those zones as they were, and then we, you know, we changed them, we modified them, we, you know, like, you know, chasms in the ground and filled them up with lava, and, you know, did some stuff like that. Um, but these zones are actually completely rebuilt from scratch. These aren't zones because you can't really go from Outland to what it was before by kind of naturally modifying things. Um, this is actually a complete redo, although kind of faithfully with uh, represents sort of a lot of the, the, the ideas that you kind of know and love from Outland. So this gives you a sense of scale. Uh, Outland compared to Granor, obviously it was very important to us to maintain very similar proportions so it would feel right. Uh, and of course there are new zones. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, I forgot to talk about Spires of Iraq. We go back there down to the south, Spires of Iraq. That is the uh, home territory of the Arakoa. Uh, this is back before, you know, they, they wound up all, you know, cursed the way they are in Outland. Uh, so you'll see kind of their an, an epic vision of what their civilization was. Oh, yeah, so in the corner, you've got at the very bottom left down there, um, there that's a mysterious ogre continent. The, the ogres came from Britain, right? And the ogres at this time were at the height of their empire. Um, their empire exists mostly on the continent, down to the south. Um, but they've, you know, their influence has spread to Granor, and you'll see, um, you'll see one really epic city built of the ogres. Uh, the ogres also have blades, fire, citadel, stuff like that. So you'll get to see their civilization for what it was, um, you know, before they they got, you know, pushed into this whole uh, war thing by the, you know, by the events that you guys know. Stuff. And, and Tom, just to jump in on that, um, the one thing that really makes Draenor different from Azeroth is that Azeroth has all these different empires over time, right? You know, from the, from the ancient Night Elves, the Trolls, you know, there's all these different kind of handprints of who is in control at any given time. And what's really interesting about Draenor is it's a much more savage, savage world. The Ogres are really the only civilization that had any kind of empire. They, they were it. They were the thing. So it's kind of fun, like, as their empire's very much in decline by this time, uh, it's really all the, the cavemen coming out of the woodwork, you know, the, the orcs and the Makhnathal and things like that that are really kind of taking over, you know, the ruins of that former empire. Decadent and degenerate. Oh, well, we've got Farallon. Uh, that's that's TBD. You, know, you, you guys will explore that later on. <laughs> so uh, what you knew as Netherstorm at this time was Farallon. And uh, um, you'll, you'll be adventuring there in a patch, uh, but it's not there the launch of Warlords of Draenor. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to... There's a lot to get through. Forward. So with that, uh, Chris, maybe you want to talk about the Orc clans themselves. Sure. Um, so I'll try and go through these really quick. So the Frostwolf clan is a very storied clan, is the clan from which uh, Durotan, the chief, uh, comes, and his boy to be born one day is Thrall. 
So one of the really fun things about this expansion set is uh, to actually kind of go back in time. Um, we'll get to this in other panels, but uh, um, go back to this era, like withdrawal, um, and he gets to uh, deal with some family business, um, and he gets to see where he came from and how epic his parents were, and, and he's, there's a, actually a much larger family in the line of Duratan. Um, and we actually uh, we get to hang out with them. There's some there's some tension point on you know Duratan as as a fairly noble orc. You know, will he join this Iron Horde? His worry about the Horde last time is that they're all turning green and growing spikes out of their eyeballs. He didn't think this demon thing was very good for business. So this time around, uh, you know, he's kind of on the line. So that's part of the fun of the adventure, you know, through uh, Frostfire Ridge that we'll have is kind of interacting with the Frostwolves and seeing which way they will go. Shadow Moon, Nerzumur. Some of you may remember this Yahoo is the orc uh, that one day, well, at least in our continuity, becomes the first Lich King. Uh, so at this time, you know, Nerzul and his Shadow Moon clan, the Shadow Moon are kind of more like scryers. Um, you know, they kind of read the stars. Um, they're kind of the shaman to the shaman, if you will. Um, so, you know, Garrosh and the warlords have come to Nerzul and go, are you in or are you out? And so much of the events of Shadow Moon Valley relative to the Iron Horde are illustrating the kind of crux of the Shadow Moon Clan, are they worthy to be in or to be out? Will history replay itself? The Shattered Hand. I love this clan. They're, they're creepy. Kargath Blade Fist uh, it was a villain from Warcraft 2. Um, the idea behind the Shattered Hand is that they were not a natural clan. They were orcs from many different clans who were enslaved by the ogres and worked in the mines and, and just had a miserable existence. And Kargath being one of the most clever and willful and just frankly big of these orcs in bondage, one day decides that he's had enough. And he strangles one of the, one of the ogres with his, with his slave chain and he uses his ax to cut off his own arm and sever the chain that bound him to slavery. And then he throws that bloody thing at the feet of all the orcs around him and goes, who's next? And they go, we're with you, man. And so their whole, the whole giddy up in this clan is to kind of fasten on to sever their own hand and fasten on some kind of piece of weaponry or something. And uh, they're, they're a very dark, uh, very pain-minded clan. The Black Rocks are the backbone of the Iron Horde. Uh, in, the, in, in our timeline, Black Hand was the first war chief and we depicted him as kind of maybe a little craven, like a bully. Um, and he loved to lord over people. Um, as we see him as a younger orc here, without the influence of... It's weird. It's a great problem for you guys. Without the influence of Gul'dan... We'll get to that later. Blackhand's kind of a more honest orc. And the Blackrock clan, we, 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 we show our... They're smiths. As Garrosh comes from the future with this, he's kind of, for, for all intents and purposes, blueprints kind of crazy tanks and war machines, it's the Black Rock clan that will stand up and really create their giant, you know, smoke pumping foundries and build this war machine for these warlords. Their land of Gorbron, uh, the current area is, it's I'm trying to think of the outland equivalent. It's kind of in the middle. It's kind of a little bit of like where Blade's Edge begins to happen. Um, as you see on the earlier map, we have the Sea of Zangar, but the Zangar Marsh has not yet formed. Um, though there's a little bit of some toadstools, things like that. But Gorgron is kind of central Draenor. Um, and they come from a place of lots of steam and lots of ore and things like that. <sighs> Gromash. That's the funny thing about those Hellscream boys, is even when they don't have demon piss in their veins, there's still a lot of fun at parties. Grom's got some, uh, he's got some anger issues. There's a story there. Um, and as you might assume, there's a really interesting interplay with, with Garrosh, who's come back to kind of redeem his heroes. Um, and obviously, Gromash will play a major role uh, in the story to come. Uh, and the whole tension point with Grom is what? It's going to happen all over again. Will his anger get the best of him? Or will he be a great, a great leader? I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on Grom, uh, Gromash and the Warsong clan are much like Mongols. 
wolf riding badasses they're in cavalry right they roll through the plains of nagran rocking the ogres and anyone else that gets in their way so it's really fun to leverage them into kind of an earlier pardon me an earlier more idyllic look at nagran a little less of the floating bean brothers you know land masses in the sky but it's very much that idyllic land you guys remember um, from outland Uh, the Bleeding Hollow, another one of those, just like the just like the Shattered Hand. I love this clan, and not a lot of people know a lot about it. That is probably because we hadn't made up a lot about it until very recently. But Kilrog Deadeye, the, the Bleeding Hollow are a very shamanistic clan. They come from the Tanan jungle. The Tanan jungle is the landmass that will become Hellfire in your timeline. Uh, back in the day, it was a very lush, very monstrous jungle. Uh, and the Bleeding Hollow, with their deeply shamanistic roots, um, well, I would say they're shamanistic, but they're absolutely out of their mind. Um, they are a dark, bloody-minded clan, and their shamanism is, is very tribal, and it's very, um, it's very bloody-minded. And you would say through, through the ritual that all of the Bleeding Hollow chiefs have taken for generations, Kilrog included, is that on the, the eve of them becoming the chief, they go down into these cisterns with the Blair Witch shit all over the ceiling and it's just gnarly, and they gouge out their own eye to receive a vision of their death. And that vision of their death predicates how they will lead their clan in slaughtering their enemies and seeking just perfect, bloody-minded victory. It's hard to get out. I'm exhausted. Yeah, we're good. All right, so next we're going to talk about some of the creatures and the zones you're actually going to see in Draenor. So this is a list of just some of the races and the creatures that you're going to come across here. As uh, Chris and Tom were talking about earlier, one of the cool things about Draenor is that there's not a lot of civilized, established races here, so it gives us a chance to do... Uh, just a different set of things, these giant, brutal creatures that you're going to run into. We've got some concept art here, a few of these. Uh, a lot of you might remember Gron from Burning Crusade. Uh, the Gron here are a completely different breed. You can see here they've been uh, subjugated by the Iron Horde and being used as part of the army. This is another really, really awesome, unique looking creature. This is called a Genosaur. Uh, now, you can't really get the scale here from this picture, but this creature is something along the lines of the Magnetar from Northrend. It's kind of in that scope, so imagine this thing lumbering and across a uh, plane towards you. So here's the ogres. We mentioned earlier that this is the homeland of the ogres. These aren't the same ogres that you know that you fought in Dire Maul. These ogres are they're bigger, they're stronger, they're vicious. I think you can get that vibe through the concept art here. And then another new creature, brand new race, these are the Saberon. Saberon are a race that you're going to find all across Draenor. It's, it's not something that's just located in one zone. You're definitely going to be fighting with them a lot throughout the expansion. Here's a dragonfly. So to get kind of a, a sense of the scope on this, um, you can't tell it here either, but we're planning on making this a mount. So when you think about Draenor, it's like things like this. They're, they're these creatures that you might be used to, but we're showing them in a whole different way here just because this land is such a, a different place than anything you've been to before. Speaking of flying creatures, this is the Chimera. So what's neat about this Chimera is, on top of the fact that it flies, it's also got a full set of combat animations. We're going to be able to fight this guy as a boss, fight him in the world. Um, it's a really another one of those creatures that you see, and it just looks savage right off the bat just from taking a look at it. And that's the feeling we wanted to get with Draenor. So those are some of the creatures we're going to find there. But how do you get there? What's the, what's the experience? How do we actually, you know, get there and get started on this stuff? We decided to build a very specific introductory experience that all players will go through. Play feels similar to anyone that did the Death Knight experience. That was a very guided, specific thing to jump you right into the story and get you started. The same thing that we want to do here. We're going to send you on a suicide mission through the Dark Portal to at least give you a chance to get a foothold in Draenor. So we're going to have a launch event before the launch of Warlords that'll kind of set this up. The Dark Portal is going to turn red out in Blasted Lands, and people are going to start realizing something's up. We've got to deal with this. You are the one who's going to deal with this. We're going to send you through. you got to do something about the portal so you guys can even get there and get started. 
what's great about this is it just it puts you right in. You don't have to do a quest and read about it. We're going to let you play it, let you experience it as quick as we can. Now once, uh, depending on if you're Horde or Alliance, once you finish the intro experience, you're going to go to your first zone. For the Horde, that's going to be Frostfire Ridge. Frostfire is a really unique looking zone. It's a frozen tundra, but we've mixed it with this element of active volcanoes. So it creates a really awesome look. Uh, it's very different than anything we've done. It's the home of the Frostwolf clan. So you're gonna end up meeting up with Duratan here and help them. They're locked in this, this gnarly war with the Thunderlord clan, another local clan from the area. Now the Thunderlords are in the process of joining up with the Iron Horde. So it's really important for you to help put a stop to that and help the Frost Wolves really establish the fact that they are not going to join the Iron Horde. Spoilers. Whoops. There's one more really important race in Frostfire, and that's Ogres. The Ogres have a fortress here called Bladespire, and you're actually going to help early on. One of your first things you're going to do is try to recapture that fortress so you can turn it into your, essentially, your everything from this space. So this is where Frostfire is on the map. It's up here in the northwest. Here's a look at the zone map itself. There on the western side, you can see Bladespire Fortress. You can kind of get that vibe. It's obviously a snowy, cold zone. Got a little bit of concept art here. This is something we had early on that helped us really get the vibe, get a feel for what it was going to look like. It's got these unique rock structures throughout the whole zone. Really sets it apart from anything. A little anecdote on that, actually, is that we originally concepted this zone as a purple desert. Yep. But uh, it wasn't really working for us. Uh, Turned out everyone that saw it kept saying, why is that snow purple? And why are the really frost weird. wolves in a purple desert? Fine, it's snow already. <laughs> Fine. Sometimes we're dumb. Yeah. But we made it work. It's awesome. But uh, we could talk about it and look at pictures all day, but what better than to show you guys a video? So let's take a look at it. <laughs> And that is Frostfire Ridge. Uh, it's actually, it's really exciting to be able to talk about that zone because that's the first zone we actually worked on on the expansion. So it's, it's been around for a while. So it's great to finally get a chance to show it to you guys. So let's get to the Alliance. So after they finish their introductory experience, they are going to go to Shadow Moon Valley. Obviously a familiar name, a place uh, pe most people probably know what it's like now. It's completely different in this time and age. Uh, the zone is always fast in nighttime. It's, it's nighttime all the time here. Uh, it's a zone that you're never going to see the day, so it gives it another unique fit. It's something we've really tried to hit with all the zones in Draenor, is that they have a vibe. When you leave it, you're going to go, oh, that's the zone that it's always nighttime at. That's the zone that's got the crazy fire stuff. We really want to give you that hit so you remember these places. Now, Shadow Moon is the home of Karabor. Uh, it's what you know in the future as Black Temple, but at this point, it's the holy temple of the Draenei. Problem is, it's under attack by the Iron Horde. One of your first things you're going to do when you get here is stop that attack. We have to save Karabor. Without Karabor, the Draenei really don't stand a chance. If you can do that, then you can turn that into your Alliance City 
the same way we were talking about that with the ogre capital and Frostfire. These will be your two kind of capitals that you'll bind from and, and play the expansion from. There's one other player in this puzzle, though, in Shadow Moon Valley. It's the Shadow Moon Orc clan. This is the home of their clan. They're led by Nerzul, and he is hellbent on joining the Iron Horde, and he'll do anything to his people to actually make that happen. You're going to take a part in that and help try to make sure that that doesn't actually come through. So this is where it is on the map. Um, we tried to keep location in mind, make sure that it made sense in relation to where Shadow Moon Valley is in Outland. This is a look at the zone map here. You can see Karabor off to the right. Uh, the Horde invasion comes in from the north there at that dock. The Shadow Moon clan's kind of located, got a couple different camps across the zone. It's a really awesome piece of concept art that we got early on helped us set the, the mood and the vibe for the zone. I think we saw this and we were like, well, why don't we just have it be like this all the time? This looks awesome. <laughs> but again, let's just take a look at it in game. Before we do that, we wanted to give you a quick reminder. This is what Shadow Moon looked like before. It, it's just, it's a fell ridden piece of just, I mean, there's a huge volcano in the middle of the zone. Uh, it's got Black Temple in it. Um, I mean, the place was just a mess. So what you see here is going to feel much more idyllic, a completely different scene. Let's run the video. So that's Shadow Moon Valley. So we got two more zones we're going to give you a sneak peek at today. Uh, next up would be Gorgron. Uh, we talked a little bit about Gorgron earlier. It's a, it's a completely different, again, the zone is really defined by the features that are there, and it's these giant steam vents that are all across the zone. Um, they're they're be, trying to be harnessed by the Blackrock clan is working with the Iron Word here to kind of cap these steam vents, and they're using those to help run the war machine for the Iron Horde. So you can see where the zone is here on the map. It's on the northern side, kind of nestled right between Frostfire and Tanan. Here's kind of a look at what, uh, early on, we were concepting a lot to get the vibe for what would these steam bits look like? How could we really sell them in the zone in a cool way? This, re this piece really helped define what we moved on to from that. And we got a video of it to show you guys. kind of got a sneak peek there at the end of a little bit of the, uh, the Blackrock Foundry. It's actually going to be uh, one of the raids that you'll be playing in as part of uh, Warlords, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later in this panel and a little bit more in our panel tomorrow as well. So finally, we'll wrap up with Talador. Talador, in current time, is what you would know as Terracar Forest. At this point in time, it's basically the, the home of the Draenei civilization. Uh, Shatrath is there, but Shatrath is much larger than what you remember. It's actually a, a massive part of the zone, actually looks like a city that comes out from Shatrath and extends across it. 
it's got a super, super unique look too, just because we were able to, to really push that Draenei look. Uh, we've always had Draenei buildings and structures, but you've never got to see what did they look like when they were at the height, when they were, you know, they were doing everything that you would expect them to do, but you get to be a part of that and see it before everything kind of goes to hell. So Talador has some really unique, iconic places too, places like Auchendoon. We know Auchendoon in current time, it's blown up. It's, a, it's in the middle of the bone waste, right? But in this time, it's completely different. It's the, basically their holy temple. It's where when Draenei die, they want to go to Auchendoon. It's like Valhalla for Draenei. You're going to get to uh, see it also because it's a dungeon in the expansion. Uh, speaking of Shatrath, this is a piece of concept art of what it looks like on Draenor. Um, what's really cool about this is you can see it's got the water there. That's the Zangar Sea coming up right against the edge. Um, Zangar Marsh isn't fully there yet, so it's really cool to see this place, but just in a different time. And let's roll the video. <laughs> That's a sneak peek at uh, four of the seven zones in Draenor. I uh, hope you guys like that. It's uh, stuff we've been working on for a while, so super rad to be able to show it off. So now let's maybe talk about a small requested feature. We've only been working on this for a little while, um, but like everything we do at Blizzard, it's something that had to be done right. And to do this right, it was going to take time, but I think you guys are gonna be super stoked to see what we've come up with. So we had a lot of uh, guidelines when we went into this project. There were things we wanted to make sure happened. Number one was to keep the soul of the original characters. When you log in with that female troll and you've got a unique hairstyle, you've got unique tusks, we wanna make sure it still looks like what you know and what you've played for all those years, but that it just looks better. We don't want it to feel different, we just want it to, to up, increase the fidelity, have things look a lot more like in the current age. So the fidelity has been raised on all this stuff from textures, polygons, effects, um, all the different things that you'll see on hairstyles and stuff like that. We've really gone to the nines on this stuff. Most of all though is the facial detail. Um, all the emotes across the game, we've fully rigged the faces so the characters have teeth, they have tongues, they can smile, they can emote. Um, it, it really is, a, it completely changes that flavor of that character. But like I said, in a way that still feels like the soul of what that character is. On top of all of this, we've had to mod the animations to go with all these new models. So it's really been a lot of work because we can't just go in and, and update the polygons and expect it all to work. There's a lot more polygons that have to be animated. We've got to make sure everything matches up, cloaks, tails, all that stuff. Um, so it really has been a labor of love. We're super excited to show it to you guys today. So we've got three races that we're gonna give you a, a sneak preview of here. This is the male dwarf as it exists today. This is the new male dwarf with the updated model. Here's a side by side. So you can kind of see, see how his beard is still the same beard style but we've added uh, adornments to it, make it look cooler, make it feel like it fits. Next up would be the orcs, popular race. Current orc, and here's the new orcs. Here they are side by side. Again, same thing, he's got those lamb chops, they just look a lot better. And finally, come on now, gotta rep the gnomes. So here's the existing gnome, and then here's the new model. 
I think this gnome very specifically shows what all that work has really paid off. The fact that this gnome looks so much better, but man, I'll be damned, it still looks like a gnome. So we've also got some video to show you guys of these guys in action. And so that for was everyone just a here, short, really... That was just a short sneak preview of the character models. There's a World of Warcraft art panel where they're going to go into explicit detail on more races, how they did this stuff. Um, if you're looking to get info on that, I highly recommend you go to that panel. Their panel is really, really awesome this year. This was just a sneak peek. So next exactly. up, Tom's going to talk about some features. All right, so uh, what do we have here? Obviously, you guys probably saw the you know feature list go by really fast in the introductory movie, and you're going, you know, what is that? What are they doing? And uh, there was maybe something in there that you noticed that might strike a little bit of interest. So what do we have here? We've got a feature summary, uh, and we're going to talk about all this stuff. So I'll just get right into it. Garrisons. What the hell are those? All right, so what is a garrison? Garrison is the ability for you to build your own base on Draenor. So, that's right. This is, uh, this is the World of Warcraft version of housing. <laughs> Woo! This isn't a cottage in a faraway instance corner that doesn't actually exist in the world. Uh, this is your ability to actually build a base, almost as you do in the RTS games in the actual world that you will be able to see as you fly through the zones, you'll be able to see it as you go by it. Um, you know, you'll be able to invite your friends to come and see it if they want to. We'll even give you reasons to trade resources, stuff like that. But this is a full-on base. You're gonna collect followers. You're gonna send them on missions to do your dirty work. And you'll be able to customize your base. Uh, so you're gonna be able to decide where do you want to put your armory? Where do you want to put your barracks? You know, do I want to have a mage tower? Do I want to have an infirmary? Do I want to build the stables? Or you know, what profession buildings am I going to build? So you're going to have a lot of different plots and you're going to be able to pick and choose. You're even going to be able to pick which zone you want your base to be in. So a bunch of the different zones out there. Right on. A lot of the zones throughout Draenor support the ability to build a garrison. So if you got you decide that you want your garrison to be your garrison be in the hard hard zone of, of Gorgron, then that's what you can decide. If you want it to be in the Adelic Shadowmoon Valley, then that's what you can decide. You get to pick. And finally, you'll even get offline progression. So while you send your followers off on missions, let's say you assemble a group of ten followers and send them off on a raid, well that might take a week. And you might come back a week later and see what they got for you. Or you might send some guys off on a dungeon and see what they got for you the next day. Or you might send some guys off on some quests and see what they got for you in, in a couple of hours. And again, this is integ integrated directly into the world. This isn't, you know, uh, we use our seamless instancing technology so that, you know, while, you know, while it is customized to what you have built, you know, you, you see it from anywhere in the world and you seamlessly enter it and exit it. There's never any loading screen, nothing like that. It's just out there in the world. And so what do you get for it? Why would I want a garrison? Why would I want to have followers? Well, you know, for one thing, you can get up a gear for your character. You know, it's, that's kind of your core progression in World of Warcraft, is, is making your character better, and these guys can contribute to it. In addition, you get a piece of land to call your own. You know, that's, it, this, think of this as like the farm times 1,000. 
you get unique benefits from the buildings in, in terms of you know, what they do for your followers and the missions that they run. You get limited access to professions you don't even have. So for example, you know, maybe you only have skinning and engineering on your character. Uh, who would have that wacky combo? But uh, let's say you wanted uh, blacksmithing and something else, and you wanted, you know, want blacksmithing and access to something in mining. You can, you can do that. In fact, your base, you can even build a mine in your base, and that'll give you access to special mining nodes. You know, you'll, you'll get some extra mining nodes that you can go in there and mine every now and then. You can even assign an NPC that has a follower that has the mining skill to that mine, and they can do some of your dirty work for you. So uh, Corey's going to talk a little bit more about exactly how the garrisons work. So your garrison grows. When you start, it's going to be really small, and you're going to be able to expand it over a number of tiers. And every time you expand it, you're going to get more plots where you can build buildings Tom was talking about earlier. So you can get more bonuses as you grow this stuff. You get to pick which buildings you want. So like, like we said, you could build an armory over here, put a stable over there. Each of these buildings, though, offers bonuses that are completely different. So there's going to be some choice about what you want to do with that building and which one you think is most important to you. You get to choose the location. This is a key thing that we thought was really huge with the garrison, because Greg could choose to have his garrison maybe in Frostfire. I could maybe have mine in Spires of Iraq. So it's really neat that we don't have to all share the exact same space for our garrison, and you'll be able to move it. So maybe at a, at a later point, you've had this garrison in this, this zone for a few months, you can up and decide to move it to a different place just because you think that's cooler. Your garrison is the point of interaction, though, with all of these followers that you'll be collecting. So you'll be going to the garrison to manage your followers, send them on missions to do that stuff. So it's really an active place. We're, we're going to really set it up so it feels like if you found a follower, you're going to see that follower walking around in the garrison. You gave him a name, you'll see that name when he's walking around in there. We really want it to feel like it's your place. Going along with that is the concept of monuments and trophies. What this is is, is a way to show off. If you've got this big piece of land here in Draenor, we should let you do some stuff with it. So we're thinking the idea behind this would be monuments could be tied to achievements. So let's say you, uh, you got the achievement for exploring the entire world. You, you went into every single zone there is. We could give you a monument, per se, that's like maybe like a big globe or, or something that looks really cool in your garrison that you can show off to other players. Same concept with trophies. Maybe you kill a rare mob out in Draenor somewhere. You kill a chimera or something, and you get to bring back its head and mount it in the town hall in your garrison. So let's talk a little bit more about the buildings. The buildings, as we, as we mentioned earlier, there's lots of different buildings to pick from. Um, they come in different sizes, and they all offer different unique bonuses. Those bonuses can affect lots of different things in the game. They can, make your, they can give you uh, things in your garrison specifically. Um, they could also do things to your character outside the garrison. Maybe you get a buff when you're, when you're not there. Um, and they also do things that make your followers better at the missions they're running. Like uh, an example would maybe be like an infirmary. You can buy an infirmary and it makes it so that the recovery time when your followers get back from a mission is shortened. If that's something you want, you can buy that and you can upgrade it over time. So when you buy that infirmary, it'll start out really small, maybe like a little tent. And over time you can have this choice to upgrade it and increase the bonus as it gets bigger. Now, right now we're talking about doing three upgrades on the buildings. When you hit that third upgrade, we wanted to really do something special for it. Let it feel like it's customized to you. And that's what specializations are. A specialization will probably feel similar to your talent tree. So imagine a building and it's got a couple different options on it. When it hits level three, you can choose one specific option for every building. Um, and those vary as well. Those can be things that would, maybe the infirmary gives you the option to resurrect out in the world like once per day. You know, someone from your infirmary shows up and reses you. Or uh, maybe it's something specifically for your followers so they can be stronger on a mission. It's just something, another way that you can customize this place and make it feel like your own. Speaking of making it feel like your own, you got to be able to pick where this stuff goes. So maybe you want to put your mage tower up on the hill in your garrison. Maybe you want to put your mage tower up near the front gate because you think that looks cooler. We're going to let you do that. You're going to get to pick where you want to put the buildings. This variety is really what gives us that customization we're looking for. Here's a look at one of the buildings. This is the inn. Uh, this inn in this shot is rank two. The bonus that the inn is going to give you is the opportunity to find new followers. So the inn has a bar, 
Lots of people stop by the bar. I hear there's a few at BlizzCon here today also. Um, so you can go to buy this building and you'll get a chance to find a new unique follower every day. This building also comes with a kitchen. That kitchen has a cooking NPC in it. Like Tom mentioned, there's some access to different profession stuff that you can get through the buildings. And of course it has specializations. The specializations on this building give you the chance to kind of hone in on what kind of follower you're looking for. Maybe you need a tank specifically for some of the missions you're running. You can pick that here and the next day you'll have a better chance of finding that type of follower. So here's a look at how the buildings upgrade. This is a huge undertaking. There's a massive amount of art that goes along with all the gameplay that's built into this system. Each building has unique art like this that upgrades over time with it, both the interiors and the exteriors. Speaking of interiors, that's a look at the barracks from the outside, and this is the inside, so you can just kind of get a feel for the level of detail we have in this stuff. Now this is a look at a work in progress, UI, of, uh, of how we would see people interacting with the garrison. So on the left there, you can see your buildings. So you can pick a building and just drag it over to a slot. Uh, the plots themselves come in three sizes, so you just match up the building with that size. Pay the currency cost that it'll be to build it, and off you go. Anyone that's seen the pet stuff is pretty similar. This is a video showing the garrison upgrading. So before you ask, yes, there is separate art for Alliance and Horde. Horde will get their own complete, unique set of buildings and have their own look. So once you have your garrison, you need to fill it with followers. Lots of ways to get followers throughout the world. You can find them and bribe them to join uh, your mission. You can earn faction with them and have them join you. Um, we're going to give them out in a lot of different ways to get people out into the world. What you do with followers is you send them on missions. We have a wide variety of missions they can be sent on. When they run the missions, they earn experience points to help them level up. So they're gonna level from 90 to 100, just like you are. Once they max out, you can keep uh, increasing their strength though by equipping them with gear, which gives them higher item level. So it doesn't just end when a guy hits 100, he can keep going by increasing his item level after that. Imagine that. What a new concept. Now followers also have abilities and traits. These are the kind of things that you're gonna use when you send a follower out on a mission you'll try to match up your abilities and traits with the things that are on that mission so they can have an advantage. And of course, they also come with quality. So anyone that's used to the pet system kind of understands that concept where they, you can find a common, you can find a rare, you can find an epic, same concept here. And of course, you can customize them with names. So if you want to name your guy Johnny McCool, you can name him Johnny McCool and that's what he'll be like in the game. Anyone that comes to your garrison will see that guy named that. So this is a look at another mock-up UI of what it would look like to have a follower. This player is really lucky because he has Oprah Winfury in his list over there. It's really rad. I think this guy so just from became here, a new major world NPC. <laughs> so over on the right there, you can see his abilities. You can see some of the gear he's equipped with. Um, so this gives you a little bit more detail on a follower. So you send these guys on missions. Uh, there's going to be a pretty, pretty wide variety of missions you can do. Tom mentioned earlier you could maybe send them on a raid, you could send them to a dungeon, send them on quests. That's all going to be up to you. And what you do is you mix those missions with followers that have the right traits and abilities. 
kind of like a, it's kind of like a mini game in its own way to match up the right guys so that they're successful on those missions. We also have this concept of specialized missions, and these are unlocked by buildings. So let's use the infirmary as another example. When you buy and place an infirmary, that then gives you the option to run rescue missions. And rescue missions are very unique. Only people with infirmaries can run them, and they'll have different bonuses from other missions. So another way that the buildings that you choose help customize what your garrison is like. Here's a look at the mission screen. So on the left is your followers, on the top is the party, and so you just drag your followers into those slots, and then as you do that, uh, you can see the bonuses that they'll earn on those missions, and then you send them off. And like we mentioned earlier, this works completely offline. So a mission could take hours, it could take days, it, you know, it all just depends on which one you pick to do. But that's not the only feature. There are many, many more, and we're gonna have Greg talk to you about some of those. All right, BlizzCon, you still with us? I know it's a lot of information. We've got a lot more to go. It'll take about two and a half more hours and we'll be good. <laughs> Boost to 90. Look at this orc, he's so happy. What are we talking about Boost to 90? So you'll hear us say this a lot this weekend. WoW is a game that is better with friends. Such as all of you. So tell me, do you know this story? You get a friend, um, someone who hasn't played WoW with you, or maybe they took a break and they want to come back, and you're like, awesome, we really need a healer. Just play for the next four or five weeks, get some gear, and then you can finally raid with us. And the dude's like, okay, I'm in. It is awesome that all of you, I'm assuming everyone in this room has a max level character, and a lot of you probably have many max level characters. But we want to make sure all your friends do too. We want to make sure as soon as Warlords of Draenor comes out, all of you can get in and jump right into the action without having to go back to Burning Crusade or Lich King and play catch up for weeks and weeks. So, when you purchase Warlords of Draenor, you get to boost one of your characters to level 90. For some of you, this may be a character that never quite made it. For a lot of you, this is going to be, you just got a brand new level 90 alt. If you've ever experienced what we do with Scroll of Resurrection, we want this transition to be really clean. We don't want you to have a lot of, you know, fell iron or some quest in Grizzly Hills that's half completed. So we'll clean up your bags, we'll clean up your quest log and your action bar. We're not going to take anything away from you, it'll all be there. We just want to make the, uh, the experience really seamless so you can jump right in and start having fun in the, uh, the Return to the Dark Portal adventure. Inventory updates. So we've introduced this concept um, you guys are familiar with of collections. Currently we have pets and mounts that are collected. What this means is you earn it once, and it's account-wide, and you can use it on any of your characters, across realm, things like that. So, what are we going to add to pets and mounts? We're going to add... So, this is your new heirloom UI. Anything you want is stored here. All of the icons that are grayed out, just with the pet journal, will give you information about where to acquire it, so you don't have to try to remember, was it some vendor in Stormwind, or was it a rare drop, or something like that. All the information is there. And again, this is cross-realm on any character, so you don't have to worry, who had my heirloom? Was it that one dude? I can't find it. Everything's here when you need it. We know, it, it's time. You've earned it. It's really account-wide. And then this is the toy box, it works similarly. Um, you can see a couple of the toys up at the top are starred. We've also added a, um, a mount journal that also has starred favorites, including a button that's like, summon random favorite mount. Your bags are still a mess, even with all the heirlooms and toys taken out of them. So what can we do about that? We don't think big bags is the answer. It takes forever to find stuff in it as it is. 
Instead, we're just trying to organize it a little better. These are a lot of requests we've gotten over the years, and we're finally able to deliver on some of it. So there's a lot of information on this screen. The first thing is, you can assign each bag a particular type of inventory. So you can say, I only want consumables to fill up this bag to help you find your stuff better. Secondly, you'll see the uh, white icons indicate new items that have gone into your bag since you last opened them, so you can find that new stuff pretty easily. And then we also highlight the um, different quality of the items. You can see some of the um, rare and epic items have their appropriate blue or purple um, outlines around them. And then finally, the bag that has all the gold icons shows you at, quickly at a glance that that's vendor trash that you can safely get rid of. And in addition, we're not going to put quest items in your bags at all. We'll just store these items right on the Quest UI so you can see them. If, if there's a clickable item, it'll be there. And again, hopefully, you know, we may give you bags that are slightly larger, but overall, it should be a much better experience, and you'll spend more time killing orcs and less time organizing stuff. You didn't mean that, orcs. It wasn't personal. The bad orcs. And then finally, um, we're just going to allow you to craft directly from your bank. So if you have resources there, you can just access them right away without so much mailing. We're also going to increase the stack size on a lot of these things up to 100, so you'll get a little bit more of your bag space back. What is the adventure guide? Now, I know all of you out there are masters of World of Warcraft. You never have any questions about where to go or what to do next, but we know that's not true of everyone out there. So the Adventure Guide is really designed, particularly when a new, um, a new patch comes out with new content, and you're like, am I supposed to finish doing the current stuff, or am I supposed to jump right away? Blizzard, tell me what to do. So the Adventure Guide is a path to gear upgrades. It shows you the new content that's out and what might be appropriate to you. And most importantly, it's customized for your character individually. So this happy little gnome here, we've identified, plays a lot of PvP. So if you can imagine, when the Siege of Ogremar patch came out, we would tell them, hey, Deepwind Gorge is out, that's something you want to try. And we noticed that you're um, rank 7 in the Brawler's Guild, so maybe you want to go to rank 8. Along the bottom, we also show you, based on your current gear, the kind of raid content that we think you're ready for. And then this is a more PvE-focused player. Um, one of the things to point out is that we mentioned the Sky Golem specifically because we know you're an engineer. So we can customize all of this for your character. If you haven't played a dude in a while and you come back in, you can kind of figure out what you're supposed to do next. Level 100 talents. We can't count, so we gave them to you five levels early. You can go play Frostfire or Shadow Moon today at BlizzCon. I doubt you'll reach level 115 minutes, but I know you guys are pros. You'll still be able to open up your talent tree and see these new talents. Um, these are fairly early designs, but um, we're, we're, you know, they're not just standard. We're taking them seriously, so feedback is appreciated. One thing to note is we're going to start splitting out the tooltips of talents a little more by spec. Particularly, um, classes like Druid and Priest have these pretty wordy tooltips that say, if you're Shadow, it really does this. If you're Holy, it really does this. So, I'm just adding that as a caveat because some of the tooltips you'll see at BlizzCon are, are quite long. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, Ian will now talk to you about our incredible Dungeons and Raids. All right, well, it wouldn't be a new expansion without some new Dungeons and Raid content, so of course we've got some of that. Um, we're really happy with the overall amount of multiplayer group content that was in Mists of Pandaria. So we've heard you guys, we could probably have used some more patch dungeons, something we're, we're still thinking about looking to do. Hear you on that one. Well, let's jump right into this. So dungeons. Um, we're going to have seven new dungeons available at launch in Warlords of Draenor. Um, four of these will be available as you level up, three exclusively at max level. And you may see that last bullet point there. <laughs> so 
so we always, we always look to see, you know, if it makes sense with the story that we're telling, where the expansion's going as a whole, it's great to have this opportunity to revisit old favorites, old classic dungeons, update them the way we've done with places like Dead Mines or Scalamans or Scarlet Monastery. And given the central importance of the Blackrock clan to the Iron Horde and their plans, uh, this felt like a great time to revisit Upper Blackrock Spire. So that's going to be overhauled, and it will be a new dungeon available at level up as well as max level. And you can see what's going on there. There are some interesting things. Uh, we're going to have normal heroic and challenge difficulties of all these dungeons. Um, one slight difference between this and Mists of Pandaria is that we will have normal versions of the max level dungeons to really flesh out a full tier of itemization and progression to help you get ready for some maybe more challenging heroic dungeons. So between these max level normal dungeons and scenarios, you can be prepared. And we're happy with how challenge modes have worked out in Mists, so we're continuing to do them to provide some really challenging multiplayer group content for people who want to push themselves in dungeons. So, one dungeon, let's take a close look at this. The Blood Mall Slag Mines. It's uh, located in Frostfire Ridge, and the Blood Mall Ogres are just running this brutal mining operation inside pretty much an active volcano. Uh, there are this four, it's a four boss dungeon with a non-linear layout, so you can kind of work your way through as you choose, but the final boss will be the final boss regardless. Um, what's going on here is Ogres that are, you know, putting people, putting Frostwolf Orcs, putting Draenei hard to work in this volcano, and as you go through, depending on your faction, you will liberate them, kind of stage a revolt, raise allies on your side, and take down the cruel master of the mines. Uh, now, this dungeon is completely playable on the floor of BlizzCon today, so if you are here with a few, you know, friends, guildmates, you can line up as a group of five and jump right in. If not, maybe you can, you know, spam the equivalent of a trade chat as you're waiting in line, try to find a group to put together. Uh, while this dungeon is in a horde starting zone, if you're alliance, you'll have an item in your bags that will teleport you to the dungeon. So both factions can check it out. Curious to see what you guys think when it's on the floor. Um, this is a look at a 2D layout for the dungeon. Here you see some of the nonlinearity. Basically, there's, there's a ring that you can work your way around. One boss on the left side, one boss on the right side. One patroller that makes his way through the mines as a whole. Once all three have been defeated, you can access the boss in the back. And we have a video for you guys. We'll walk through of the mines. So, and of course, that's just one dungeon of the many. Um, some of the others that you're going to be seeing in Warlords, there's a dungeon set at the Blackrock Foundry in Gorgrond, where you can really see the Blackrock War, Black War Machine kind of in full swing and help take that apart. Um, Alkin Dune in Talador. As you mentioned earlier, this is not the smoldering crater that you may remember from Outland. This is the holy mausoleum of, of the Draenei, where, where their souls go to rest, but also to be protected from the Burning Legion and the Eridar that eternally hunt and thirst for Draenei's souls. And maybe you know, the followers of a fellow named Gul'dan might have some interest in a place like that. We'll have to see. Uh, the Arakoa Spires, looking down upon the land and the spires of Iraq, these are not the hunched, twisted Arakoa that were cursed in Outland. This is the majestic winged race that has a high civilization, and you'll be seeing what they're up to there. 
uh, in Shadowmoon Valley, the Shadowmoon clan, Ner'zhul, beneath the earth, is working and you know, dabbling with dark powers in the Shadowmoon burial grounds as he slips further into his descent into darkness. And you'll have to go in there and put a stop to what he's doing, of course. And the Iron Barracks, where an army is being raised, this army that's going to march into and take over Azeroth, unless you stop them, and more. So that's just the dungeons. Of course, raids. Um, as I mentioned, we're happy with the amount of raid content that was available in Mists of Pandaria at release. We like the way the staggered two-tier rollout worked, where we had Mogushan Vaults initially, and then Heart of Fear and Terrace of Endless Spring afterwards. So we're kind of looking to mirror that going forward into Warlords. Uh, there are going to be two new raid zones available. The one right at the outset is going to be the Ogre uh, raid at High Mall in Nagrand. This is a bit of that high Ogre civilization that we talked about earlier. This is going to be a six boss raid and will kind of whet your appetite for the things that are to come. After that, you'll be able to venture into the Blackrock Foundry, where really this is the war machine of the Iron Horde. It's, but it's the height of its military might. The processing, refining of the Blackrock ore, for which the Blackrock clan gets its name, as it's forged into weapons and armor and war machines that are assembled and sent off to the front lines to wreak havoc upon Draenei and eventually Azeroth. And War uh, Warlord Blackhand you know, commands this from the interior of the Crucible, and you need to go in there, work your way through this 10-boss raid, and put a stop to his plans. We'll be talking a bit more about this raid at our later Raiden Systems panel. And of course, we'll see the return of world bosses. There'll be fierce new world bosses in the model of, you know, Shav Anger, Ordos, Nalak, etc. Always continuing to learn from our experiences there, improve upon the experience we're delivering, and give players that really epic multiplayer feeling of, you know, 30, 40 frost bolts flying through the air as you fight something in the outdoor world, not necessarily in an instance. You know, in addition to some of the specific raid content, that we're releasing, um, we've also taken a moment to reflect upon our philosophy and how we're approaching the design of our raids. So, any flex raiders in the house? Awesome. Yeah, we're, we're super happy to see how flexible raiding has worked out so far in patch 5.4 and how it's been embraced in uh, Siege of Orgrimmar. I think that it, it really, flexible raiding offers a solution to a lot of the social problems that, that often are one of the downsides of group raiding. Anytime there's a mismatch between the number of people on hand that want to raid and the fixed size of raid content. If you have eight people looking to do a 10 player raid, well, you're gonna have eight pretty unhappy people. If you have 12 people looking to do an eight, a 10 player raid, well, then you have to deal with who sits on the bench, maybe no one wants to, that's not very much fun either. And one of the great things about the flexible structure is the ability to come and go if you don't have to feel guilty if you miss a raid or if someone logs on in the middle of the night, they can hop right in, you just keep going. And it's really opening an experience that we think of as a core part of the multiplayer role-playing experience to more people. And that's fantastic. Now, for several years now, for a couple of expansions, we've supported a parallel 10 and 25 player structure. From Wrath of the Lich King onward, and then in Cataclysm, we're really took efforts to make them truly equal in terms of difficulty and reward. But there have been tensions throughout that system that we've experienced. And, you know, trying to reward them equally, trying to keep the difficulty equal, while trying to recognize the logistical difficulties of keeping a 25-player roster together, but also not making the 10-player raiders feel like second-class citizens. There's just been this kind of, you know, struggle, this back and forth between the 10 and the 25 camps. Well, one of the things that we see out of flexible, one of the potentials of flexible raiding, is that in this 10 versus 25 war, everyone can win. And we see flex as the way forward in that regard. Um, so we're looking to see how can we expand flexible mode, how can we expand the scaling tech that we have to suit other types of raid structures, other difficulties. How far can it go? One of the first things that we realized when we were testing flexible mode of Siege of Orgrimmar on the PTR is that actually, really the biggest difference between that and normal mode raiding was just the tuning. Um, people who might have tested the very first early flexible tests on PTR may remember when we were scaling your item level down maybe a bit too far and the tuning was maybe a little bit too high, it actually felt pretty much just like a normal mode raid, except you had 21 or 19 or 14 people, and, and that was the core difference. So obviously that wasn't our tuning target for 5.4 Siege of Orgrimmar flexible mode, but it was this great proof of concept for where we could go in the future. And, and we see no reason why what's currently normal mode difficulty can't just work flexibly instead. So you can do it with 10, 25, 14, 19, however many people you have on hand. And so that leads us to continue to think, well, is there, anything, is there anything else that Flex can do for us? 
What about rate finder? Now, rate finder, I think it makes sense to continue to match make to a fixed group size. However, I'm sure most of us who've done rate finder have had the experience where you're about to pull the boss, a couple of DPS and a healer or something drop, and you're standing around with 22 people in the group waiting for it to backfill. Wouldn't it be nice if the boss could just scale down smoothly in difficulty so you could just go ahead and pull instead of waiting? With flexible scaling, we can make that happen. Now, is, so is there anything flex can't do? Well, okay, yes. Um, there's the one area where we don't think that flex scaling is really very well suited is the most cutting edge, the most tightly tuned hardcore content, because the reality is there, it's a challenge for us to begin with just to tune it correctly for two difficulties currently, and this is the audience that really is going to try to min-max and take every possible advantage. The last thing we want to see is for the right answer to be to do boss three with 17 people and then drop to 14 for boss four and so forth. No one wants that, we're not gonna do that. Don't worry. But what that means is that really, cutting edge content is best suited in terms of tuning, in terms of presentation, to a single raid size. And we've been looking, since we've been, we've been getting rid of this parallel 10 and 25 structure in our normal mode, and we've been thinking, what can we do about that for our current heroic mode? And what we're doing is looking to consolidate to a single 20 player raid size going forward. We were trying to pick an intermediate point that would be a compromise between the two existing raid sizes, but also allow for us to do some things like assume that you have at least one of every class present. So if you really missed the enslaved demon mechanic on High King Malgar way back when, or spell steal mechanics, we can do that. I don't know that we do exactly that, but we can do that. And it will provide a, a much more level playing field, more tightly tuned content, and a better experience all around going forward. So to sum up, this is the picture of raiding in Warlords of Draenor. We're streamlining, we're condensing from six separate modes of raiding down to four. We'll have Raid Finder, which exists largely as does today, with the benefit of being able to scale slightly to accommodate variances in group size or maybe to improve queue times. We will have a normal mode that scales flexibly from 10 to 25. We will have a heroic mode that scales flexibly from 10 to 25. And for those seeking the ultimate raiding challenge, we have mythic difficulty at a fixed 20 player raid size. So we, we'll be talking a bit more about raiding and some of the philosophy that went into those changes and our systems going forward at our Raid Systems Quest gameplay panel tomorrow. But in the meantime, let me hand this off to Tom, who's going to talk some more about PvP changes. All right. So do we have any PvPers out here? Okay. I think that was at least four. All right, so we, what are we doing with PvP? Uh, here's kind of a summary of uh, the different things that we're tackling. Uh, we're going to create a world PvP zone, and I'll talk about that first. That's probably the most meaningful, really new type of thing that we're doing compared to what we've done in the past. Uh, we're also making some UI improvements. Uh, we're going to make some changes to the way that we do battleground rewards. And we're also going to introduce a concept that we're calling Trial of the Gladiator. So to start with, what is this world PvP zone you speak of? Well. We're creating a place, it's one of those islands that you guys referenced that was off the coast. Um, uh, it's off the eastern coast of Tanan Jungle, um, it's called Ashran. And it is a staging area near the Dark Portal that both the Horde and Alliance want to control. This has faction bases on it and it has a variety of different hotspots. There are a lot of different points of interest that the different factions are going to want to control. But really more than anything else, what separates this from previous PvP world zones that we've done is that it is a PvP sandbox that is persistent and continues on uh, all the time. It isn't, uh, it isn't like Wintergrass, which really felt like a kind of an instance of Battleground because it had that start and finish. Um, this is really going to be more like a timeless isle of PvP in that all the objectives that are there are all PvP oriented, uh, but you're kind of free to go in there and do whatever it is that you want to do. Um, it's a lot like what you might think of as the original Alltrack Valley. I don't know if uh, there are many people here that played the original AV. <laughs> but, you know, there was a day when, uh, you know, you used to queue up for AV, maybe get in the battleground, uh, let's say in the morning, you could leave the battleground sometime to, to go to work or go to school, and by the end of the day, you come back and you actually jump right back into the same battleground because these things lasted sometimes 24, 48 hours. 
So that's really what this zone is all about. This is a persistent war in this zone that's going to swing back and forth as time goes on. You can come and go whenever it is that you want and take part. There are a lot of different objectives in the zone, so you'll be able to, you know, kind of p pick out whatever it is that you want to do. Do you want to take over the mine to, you know, contribute more supplies to your team? Or do you want to try to build the siege vehicle to take out the enemy base? Um, you know, whatever it is that you want to do. Maybe take over a tower, etc. And finally, this will use our cross realm technology, right? Uh, because obviously, I'm guessing maybe some of you play on a realm that doesn't have the best Horde versus Alliance faction population balance. <laughs> so what we're going to be doing is we're going to, going to be pairing up realms so that when you go into this zone, and you know, you'll know fly into the zone seamlessly just like you do with cross-realm zones, um, you will be paired up with other realms that have the opposite problem that your realm has. So uh, really what we're going to be able to do is, is to create a, a faction balance using the cross-realm tech that is at least far, far better than what it is on your home realm today. And you guys will, you know, duke it out over that, uh, over that territory. Um, and then, if the faction balance changes for whatever reason, we can at any time pair up different realms. So there it is, off the coast of Tanan Jungle. Um, this jun this uh, island actually existed in some of the really old Warcraft maps. Uh, was sort of referred to as the Deathwing Island, mysteriously. And this is just a concept piece, like a, a, it's just a mock-up to show kind of some of the environment and art assets that we're looking at using. Um, there are a lot of different pieces that we're going to be assembling to create the Horde and Alliance bases, and there are going to be a ton of different points of interest around also. Um, you know, you're looking at a zone that's going to have constant, non-stop action going on. So for any of you PvPers that really want to just feel like you can go to a zone and hang out and have some kind of, you know, entertaining killing of the other side without a whole lot of structure, this is the place to do it. You'll get to build and commandeer siege vehicles. Some of these are uh, vehicles that you might build over the course of multiple days, right? You might, you might gather some materials on one day and continue your progress on the next day, and then eventually build your, your machine of mighty destruction and, and have a rampage on your enemies for a while. You'll be able to reduce the enemy base to rubble and the battle will rage on. Here are some of the siege vehicles that you'll get to use. You'll also be able to commandeer some of the Iron Horde siege vehicles that are around. Um, you know, these, uh, the Iron Horde has had a presence here also, so you'll get a, a mix of different stuff. Uh, we have things like the incinerator, we have the blade mortar that shoots this, you know, giant net full of old weapons at your opponent, so it just kind of flays them with shrapnel. Good times. So next up, we have our UI improvements. Um, we have a lot of different things that we're going to try to do to the UI to just make the PvP experience cleaner, uh, a little easier to follow, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have our objective tracker. We're going to do capture status uh, so that you can actually see how much progress you're making toward capturing a point of interest. And we've got some little screenshots to show you what that looks like. So imagine you're looking at the Arathi Basin map, and uh, you know you. Right now, today, unless you have a mod like Deadly Boss Mods, you know you really don't have the ability to see how much time there is left to capture a point of interest. So now you'll actually be able to see that right on the map. I'll zoom in a little bit, right? So you you know be able to see how how close you are to capturing it. We'll also be able to reflect that in the actual world assets themselves, right? So you you know today you see you know when you capture the uh, the blacksmith, let's say you see the alliance flag go up. Um, and then, you know, it's gray until you finally capture it and then it, you know, turns blue. Uh, but now it'll actually fill in with its color as it's in the process of capturing. So even just as you're fighting out in the world, you'll have a better sense of how close you are to capturing that point of interest. We're also going to introduce the concept of a battleground score. So the battleground score is something that we're going to be able to do to give players a clear sense of how they're doing in the battleground. Here's a little screenshot of what the, uh, the scoreboard's going to look like in 6.0. And the default sorting, you'll notice, is by score. Um, you know, today, the default sorting is by, like, killing blows. You know, a lot of people resort their, their battleground scoreboard by, you know, damage done, or if you're a healer, by healing, stuff like that. Um, but it's really hard to 
you know, get a sense of exactly how you're doing versus other people. Um, and that feels like not really the best way to sort. So we've heard a lot of feedback over, over the years that players really want to get a better sense of how well they're doing in a battleground. And this score will factor in everything that you're doing. It's really a lot of it is based around the objectives that you're completing. And then, of course, your you know, damage and healing factor in as well. Um, so you know, your deaths, your kills, all, all that kind of good stuff. Um, this way, you really have an ability to, to look at it and see, you know, okay, how am I doing? And potentially, it could play into the rewards at the end. It could also maybe help us identify AFKers better, too. And so I also talked a bit about uh, the reward system and what we're going to try to do with that. So today, you know, one of the problems that we have with uh, PvP is that it's, it's too deterministic. Um, and we, we love some of that determinism in that you know, okay, well, I need this much honor to be able to, you know, buy the, the legs that I want to buy um, or the helmet or whatever. But it feels a bit formulaic in that you know, you know, from week to week, you know, okay, well, you know, I'm, it's going to take me about eight battlegrounds and I'll have enough honor to buy the pair of pants. And it just feels very formulaic. We thought it would be really cool to break that up with bonus random rewards. So, of course, the honor system's going to stay in place, and you'll still earn honor, and you'll be able to buy the items exactly as you do today. But wouldn't it be cool if at the end of any given battleground or even arena, if you had a chance to get lucky and win some stuff in advance? Hey, here's to getting lucky. So, uh, so what are the things that you can get? You can get items, you know, maybe those that pair of legs that, uh, that you really have been wanting to buy. You might get lucky and roll that and happen to get it in advance. You might get some bonus honor. You might get some bind on equip gear. And so while the bind on equip gear might not be the stuff that's a direct upgrade for your character, it might be, depending on where you are in your progression, it could also be really cool to put on the auction house and actually make some money off of doing PvP. Imagine that. Also, we'll have things like consumables, stuff like that, so that you know, if you ever wanted to have you know, something like the battleground potions that we used to do back in the day, this is a really cool way to, to, to earn those things. Finally, we'll also be able to do a weekly quest to upgrade an item so that it takes a little bit of the pressure off of your honor in terms of, oh, should I buy an item or should I use my honor to upgrade an item or that sort of thing. Um, we'll be able to do a weekly quest to complete, you know, to win a certain number of battlegrounds or arenas. And as soon as you do, then boom, you'll be able to upgrade an item. And last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about this thing that we're calling the Trial of the Gladiator. And so you might be asking yourself, what is the Trial of the Gladiator? I know what gladiators are, but uh, how does this work? Well, Trial of the Gladiator is the arena ladder. Um, I don't know how many of you are you know, fairly competitive in the arena these days, but yeah, hell yeah. So one of the problems that we have is that it's very difficult uh, with them, you know, to, to find people of your caliber, if you're a really high-end competitive player, to play with at the same time. And so really the Trial of the Gladiator is taking the concept of the arena ladder that we have right now and really focusing it to concentrate the queues at certain periods of time during the week so that you really get a lot of people in the queues at the same time um, and that it also provides great benefits to us uh, in terms of finding people that are exploiting. I don't know how, how much you guys know about it, but anytime, pretty much any time, there's an exploit going on with the arena ladders uh, or even the rated battleground ladders, it has something to do with a couple of sketchy dudes logging in at like 4 a.m. and queuing against their other sketchy friends and uh, manipulating the ladders. And so by concentrating all the activity into a shorter period of time, it gives us an ability to, to monitor that much more closely and also gives, it makes it a lot harder to exploit because there are a lot of people in the queues when that thing's happening. In addition, one of the really exciting things here is that we get to use what we call tournament rules. Um, so this is a lot like the, the way the arena server works, right? So when you go to the arena server, it's not a competition about gear. Anybody can go to the Trial of the Gladiator and use the vendors and put on the gear that they want to use and hop right into the Trial of the Gladiator. It is purely about the skill. So you don't, if you're the kind of person that doesn't want to grind toward your gear on a season-by-season -season basis, this is the thing for you. You show up, everybody has the same item level, you pick which items that you want to use, and you jump in there, and that's what you use. Your PvE gear won't work in there, only this stuff. And this, of course, will determine your prestige rewards. So if you ever wanted that gladiator title or mount, this is the place that you're going to do it. Uh, your regular season kind of stuff that you do 
is going to happen, you know, and you'll be able to earn your honor and conquest and buy gear and all that kind of stuff that you can use to take into the world PvP zone. But really, the crux of uh, how you're going to get the prestige stuff is through here. All right, so that pretty much wraps it up. Um, I want to thank all you guys for coming out here and. Uh